liberty lovers and welcome to the liberty mike podcast broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of dixie i am michael and i am here alone uh i've got nobody with me today um so i uh this could be a little awkward i'm not really sure how this is going to go it seems like it would be easy because I spend plenty of time talking to myself, but you know how it goes. Um, once you know somebody else is listening, it suddenly gets weird. Uh, and since you all are listening, it already feels weird. Unfortunately, Liberty Larry couldn't be here today. Um, his uh, father passed away earlier in the week, so he uh, he has family stuff to deal with, but he will be back. And um, Yeah. We're, we're certainly sorry for his loss. Um, so it's not just because of the coronavirus that I'm all alone. Although that's part of it too. Um, I, I really only have a couple of things to talk about this week. Uh, like I said, I, I expect I'll need to keep it short because it already feels weird. But, um, of course, we have to talk about the coronavirus. I have to talk about the coronavirus Luckily, Liberty Larry gets to miss out on that one. Um, this time, I'm sure we'll be talking about it plenty more. And uh, I'd also like to talk about the um, kind of the responses to it so far and what I think would be the, the more proper response or the more appropriate response or the more effective response uh, maybe would be the way to go. So, um, I am... Uh, <laughs> I, I was able finally to get some supplies today. Um, our state controlled uh, alcohol distributors are closed down, um, I guess, because of the coronavirus. Although we haven't had a huge outbreak here in Alabama. Better safe than sorry, I suppose. Uh, luckily, the private liquor store is open, so I had to pay a little bit of a premium, but I have gin now. And, uh, you know, we couldn't go through a real lockdown without without gin. Um, now I'm not drinking now though, because I don't have anybody else to pick up the slack while I take a drink. And so that might make this even more awkward. I bet this would be a lot easier if I, if I had a drink, but, uh, let's ju just, uh, go ahead and, and jump right into it. Um, so the primary concern I think with the virus, uh, and we've been stressing that we don't feel like this is a this is a huge deal, that this is as dangerous as they're claiming. And I, I maintain that position. Um, I still believe that uh, far more dangerous than the virus itself um, is the, uh, what it is that people are willing to allow their government to do in response. Far more of a concern. Um, and, uh, you know, secondarily, the uh, economic fallout from this major shutdown. Uh, I still think that those two things are far... Uh, far more of a concern than the virus itself. I don't mean to minimize it, though. So I do want to be clear that I think that we have a responsibility to each other, that if you think that you may have uh, been um, infected or that you may have been exposed, um, or if you're, you know, in one of the high-risk groups or whatever, I would recommend to people to self-quarantine. That's what I'm doing right now. Uh, there's a possibility that I've been exposed. I don't really think so. It would take several jumps to have gotten to me, but just in case, um, I, I've got things to do at home and, uh, and I'm, I spend a lot of time here anyway, so it's not so much of a problem. But uh, the other thing is that, uh, we want to, as a, as a community, and I mean, when I say community, I, I mean, in the, in the largest sense, I think that we want to do what we can to limit the spread of this virus, to create as few excuses as possible for the government to um, employ more authoritarian or draconian measures to try and rein in control. I don't think that they, that can be stopped at this point anyway, and it's you know it's not like they can really control things, but. We want to give them as little excuse as possible. And the better we can control this as a, as a community ourselves without government intervention, uh, the less we'll have to try and convince them to roll back afterwards. Um, I was listening to a, a guy in, uh, in the Bay Area in California, um, I guess middle of last week, 
And he said that they were under a shelter-in-place order. And uh, that the government was telling them that it was voluntary, that they were seeking um, voluntary compliance, that you would voluntarily choose to stay at home and, and not um, go out in public or gather in groups and what have you. But that they had uh, empowered local emergency services to ensure compliance. Now, that's some Orwellian stuff right there. Um, we are giving you a choice, but we have, uh, we have empowered our law enforcement and emergency response teams to uh, make sure that you choose the right thing. I don't know. But this is the kind of thing that I expect to, to happen more and more. And we're going to see numbers climb for a while, uh, I'm sure. Um, I, uh, there's no way that we can have this completely under control at this point, especially as we're just now getting into testing here in the U.S. The numbers are going to climb. Now, r remember that while they're um, still trying to frighten you about the number of cases as they expand and day after day after day, that pay attention to the fatality rate because the bigger that denominator gets, um, the lower that percentage becomes, generally speaking. So just remember, don't be too concerned. This is essentially a flu. Um, I'd like to point out again that uh, in this flu season, which was a fairly mild flu season, we had 20-some thousand people die of the flu in the United States. Um, and that's almost three times as many deaths as we've had from coronavirus worldwide at this point. And another thing to remember is that those coronavirus fatalities, they include um, deaths as, uh, as a result of pneumonia and other complications to the virus, whereas the flu virus deaths don't include the pneumonia. Um, the, the pneumonia is a complication of the flu, and that's a problem that exists with the flu virus as well. So I still say we're not all going to die, um, but be conscientious about it. It's clearly fairly contagious, and uh, y you know you don't want to expose um, people if you can help it. Now, moving on. The uh, so uh, my aunt called me, or well, she she sent me a text yesterday, and I called her back because she wanted to talk about the stimulus package. And what were my thoughts? Um, now we talked before about the the first $8.3 billion that was being, um, where hundreds of millions of dollars were being spent to, uh, um, for the DOD, the CIA, um, the Department of State, and all the, um, the state governments that had claimed uh, states of emergency, even though there were several of those states that had already declared states of emergency that had no recorded cases of the coronavirus at that point. So this is just a big money grab. Um, and the stimulus package, it's not a whole lot better. I, I think it's the wrong response, uh, most of it. Um, I, I'm, we're opposed just generally as libertarians to uh, corporate welfare. Um, so I understand that the airline companies and other travel sector and entertainment sector companies are going to have a really rough time with this. And that's too bad. I, I, I feel bad for those people. But um, we... You know, <laughs> we get accused all the time of uh, this idea of free market capitalism that we promote being this thing where, well, we just want businesses to succeed and, you know, we, we're all on the side of business. No, no, no. We believe in the profit and loss system. Um, if you weren't able to prepare your business for this kind of event, if you weren't able to, to plan ahead and say, what are we going to do if something happens and... Um, we're not be, we're not able to generate the kind of revenue we're used to for six months at a time, and you fail. You failed, and so uh, they talked about uh, some travel sector bailouts as part of the stimulus package. Don't believe in it. It'll keep people employed, but they're not going to be gainfully employed. I mean, not in the sense that they're doing anything productive for the rest of us. Um, if you let these businesses fail, it generates, it, it opens up the assets for somebody else to use in a more productive manner. Uh, and that includes the labor. Um, so, uh, you know, if one of these airlines fails, then it gives somebody else the opportunity to come in, buy up all those assets at a discount, and maybe do a better job of running the business. Uh, bailing them out just rewards them for 
poor planning. And it gives everybody the idea that there's no risk involved. And when there's no risk involved because, you know, the government will bail you out if things go badly, then people make really poor decisions. It creates a, a bad precedent and it incentivizes the wrong kinds of things. As for um, sending a check to everybody in the U.S., while I will accept my check if they send one to me, um, I, I, again, I don't think that this is helpful. Uh, it doesn't uh, improve the market to have people just out there spending. Um, it, it does in the sense in the way that they measure it, but not in any real sense. Um, besides, you got to remember where this money came from. The money came from you. You paid taxes. They're taking your tax money, sending it back to you, and calling it a gift. And, and somehow they're making you thankful for it. This is kind of impressive what the government's done. So it's your money, they're sending it back to you, and they call it a gift. Well, I, I, I don't think that's much of a gift. They should have just let me keep it in the first place. And there was some talk at the beginning, uh, of this, you know, some kind of proposal for no payroll taxes for this year. But they don't want to set that kind of precedent either, um, because we might get used to that. And if you came to the realization of just how much money the government was taking from you before you even got to see it, you might want to keep it that way. And, uh, of course, that kind of, um, um, of response doesn't help people that aren't employed currently and the many more that aren't going to be employed as some of these sectors start to fail. But, again, that labor is out there and it's available for other things if people can find um, new business ideas to... to um, employ people and, and make a profit during this time. The other thing is that they're trying to make loans more available, uh, they say, for small business. But the expanding the credit is the problem that kind of got us into this weird economic mess that we keep finding ourselves in anyway, where um, the credit expansion uh, results in the boom-bust cycle um, that we've seen hit us really hard in 87 and 2001 and 2008. Um, and will hit us again soon. And so what keeps happening is they expand credit. There's a bunch of malinvestment as a result of this easy money. Um, people are take riskier uh, ventures because it's so easy to get the loans and it doesn't cost them very much. And then when things go badly, um, even if you leave out the idea of the government um, stepping in and, and taking up the difference with your money and uh, bailing out businesses... Um, you have a bunch of malinvestment where people have put money into things that uh, it could have been better employed elsewhere by somebody else, maybe. And um, they, uh, the result is that once things start to go badly with maybe something like the coronavirus, um, everything contracts. Uh, they're not able to pay back the loans. They're not able to finish the, the construction or whatever it is, the expansions that they were trying to do. And we end up into a downturn. And the response to that, apparently, is to pump more money into the system and make more, more loans available and blow this up, bubble up again, bigger than last time. So that's what, that's what this will do again. So maybe the question is, what should be done instead? Like, how could we promote um, business growth or a real economic growth in this time? And I don't think it takes the coronavirus to do this. The, the, what I would suggest are things that should be done anyway, at least from my perspective, um, because they'll do a few things. Uh, they will promote small business. Um, they will promote competition. Um, they will allow more, uh, more people into the markets, and that competition push down, pushes down prices. And it encourages innovation because you've got to be able to stay on top. Um, so this is, what I would, this is what I would do. I would cut legislation in all business sectors uh, because what the legislation does is it just raises the barrier to entry. It makes it harder for anybody new to enter the, the particular industry. Um, most, of these most of this legislation is written by industry leaders. Um, it's promoted by and lobbied for by industry leaders. It costs them more, but they're able to absorb the costs easier than somebody new. And that's the whole point of it, is to make it harder for somebody else to compete with them in their, in their industry. Um, so cut legislation back tremendously. Uh, drop it all. I don't think the government should be involved in business in, in any way. But, um, you know, Trump's already done some of this, or his administration has. And so keep going. Keep cutting that legislation. That'll help uh, promote um, business growth, economic growth. 
uh, cut corporate and business taxes. I say uh, abolish them entirely. Um, you say that you want to you wanna charge businesses for this, but they're not paying these taxes. We are. The consumer's paying the taxes because all of those costs are just passed on to the consumer of whatever product they have anyway. So you want to um, improve the economy, uh, cut business and corporate taxes, um, let people uh, save that money themselves because, you know, the idea might be that if you cut these corporate taxes, it's not like the the businesses are gonna um, are gonna drop their prices in response, but they'll have to because somebody will. And this is another one of those things that raises the barrier to entry and makes it harder for new businesses to compete. Uh, the co- it raised the cost of business, raising the barrier to entry. And if you had again more businesses in the in the particular industry, more competition will drive prices down. And then finally, uh, cut tariffs. Again, this is another one of those things that it just raises costs for, um, for businesses. And big businesses can afford this and small businesses can't. Um, it would make it easier for new businesses to form and for small businesses to compete with large businesses. And once again, um, you, you know, they, <laughs> there's been a couple of reasons that have been given for tariffs. Um, one of them is that, you know, it forces manufacturing to come back to the U.S. And I guess that, that there is some truth in that. Of course, my opinion is that if you uh, cut back the legislation here, it would make it easier anyway. The reason that businesses move overseas is because it's easier, it's somehow cheaper to produce a product in China, pay tariffs, pay shipping costs, um, uh, both for the the uh, the end product and a lot of times for the materials um, to get that over there and then back over here and sell it. And you can still do that for less than producing it and selling it here. Why is that? All this legislation here that, that raises prices for businesses to produce um, and minimum wage laws and so forth. And we can have a discussion about minimum wage laws in the future. And in fact, I'm sure that we will if we haven't already. I, these all kind of run together and I have some of these discussions outside, like away from the microphone. So I, I can't even remember what all we've talked about on this podcast, but things will get repeated. And if we talked about this before, we'll talk about it again. But if you just re- reduce the cost for businesses, businesses will move back here anyway. Um, and the so cutting tariffs just allows um, other businesses to compete, smaller businesses to compete with larger businesses here in this country. It, uh, it allows uh, new businesses to form more easily um, because they can get products for a lower cost. And the other thing is just like those corporate and business taxes, it's not the the companies that are paying these taxes, you are. Um, all these costs are passed on to the consumer. Now, the uh, idea that it's to uh, to make t- businesses come back here, um, to force manufacturing to come back here by raising prices everywhere. R- remember, that that's the idea here, is that it, if you raise the price to produce something overseas, then it'll come back here where the price is already high. It doesn't help us at all. Uh, all us consumers, we're still paying the high prices. Um, but I did hear Trump the other day talking about how the tariffs on China have um, generated billions of dollars in revenue for the U.S. government. Well, this is just another way of taxing you. Um, you're being taxed again. Uh, you're taxed on the end product, but uh, in the end, what's what's happening is the ju- government is again trying to generate revenue. Um, and the only way that it can do that is by taking from somebody else. And it always ends up taken from you. Taxation is theft, right? So those are the things that I would do. Cut legislation, cut corporate and business taxes, cut tariffs. Um, that'll free up a lot of money, uh, a lot of capital to, to um, grow the economy. And we're going to have a rough time probably from this because everybody's staying home. Things are shutting down all over the place. People don't want to be in groups, so entertainment, travel, and so forth. These, these things are going to suffer. And in the meantime, um, the labor in those businesses will just have to move somewhere else. There's other things to be done. And uh, then when this is all over with, and, and it will be, um, this will pass, uh, then all those, uh, those businesses will start hiring again. And you know what's the great thing about that is if you've created a bunch of other kinds of jobs in the meantime, when those businesses come back and 
employers are competing for employees, that drives prices up. Supply and demand in the in that market as well. So the the labor market um, functions in supply and demand as well. So this is all good for us in the long run. And instead of thinking about these various businesses and their employees that may suffer, think about the consumer because those various businesses and their employees, these are another kind of special interest. They're interested in the airline business as an example. Um, but we're all consumers. And so if we can keep prices down for consumers, that benefits all of us, whereas uh, keeping these people employed with government subsidies, um, that only benefits that industry, and it costs all the rest of us. Uh, let's see. What else? I guess that's it. Um, I've been going for about 20 minutes here, and uh, talking to myself for 20 minutes when I know you're listening, is probably enough. So we'll be back again next week. Um, expect to be. Uh, hopefully Liberty Leary will be back um, with me by that time. And uh, in, you know, in the meantime, do all the stuff I always ask. Follow us on Facebook and, and, um, Facebook and uh, iTunes. Subscribe, like, share, thumbs ups reviews, et cetera, et cetera. And um, we'll be back in a week when we finally get this right. In the meantime, try and stay free. Ciao.